Welcome to my review and thoughts on the 2002 movie Spider. And let us dive right in. So, there we go. So, uh, yes. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies because that it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the book, so it sucks, whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that review. And let's see. Right, and, you know, this is one of those movies where you shouldn't know very much about it before you start watching it. I'm going to pretty much avoid anything that will hurt the experience of watching a movie before I get into the sports sections. So I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I started the video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I'll warn, verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I'm the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So, yeah. Um, before I get much further, I want to make it clear. Yes, I'm going to criticize. There's a couple of things. I'm going to be criticizing certain things that the movie shows that, you know, similar things have happened in real life. I am criticizing the way things used to be when it comes to, like, mental health care. I know that a lot of places it's much, much better today. If you are, you know, a loved one of, of someone who's receiving mental health care, please don't automatically assume that everyone is as bad as many of the people in this are. Uh, you know, it is, like, the movie is 21 years old, and the, you know, some of the things that it shows are older than that. Now, the, yes, so that's one thing, and the other big thing is, there are some very misogynistically depicted female characters in this, when I criticize them, I want to make it clear I am not a misogynist, and I really don't get the sense that Cronenberg or the movie are either. It's that the movie is so deep in the first-person perspective of Spider, the titular character, and he, you know, he's not meaning to be a misogynist. He's been misinformed. He's he's going off, you know, stereotypes that is, so, so yeah, that is what the, yes, so the, the, let's see, uh, that is, that is all that, yes, so the movie's rated R, so is this video, you know, I will be talking about some of the you know, really harsh stuff. Uh, yeah, there's some swearing in the movie. I might swear in this video. And let's see. And that brings us into. Yeah, so. I am not entirely sure how many times I've watched this, but it is maybe half a dozen times total. The first, my first viewing was in 2005, and my most recent viewing was right before I hit record on this vlog. Now, 
Let's see. Yeah, so the plot I'm going to be using and bees here. A mentally disturbed man takes residence in a halfway house. His mind gradually slips back into the realm created by his illness where he replays a key part of his childhood. And let's see. The, yeah, and the, the technical side is very impressive. There's a lot of talent and enthusiasm on display. And yeah, so this was written by Patrick McGrath, who you know he wrote both the book, the the novel, and the the screenplay. Or the, yeah, it says written by at least, uh, you know, and it's one of those you know sometimes that means that the person. You know, because he wrote the book, so he wants as much of the book in there as possible. Even you know, and he's struggling to kill his darlings because he did that when writing the book. You know, this is not one of those. This is like here, one hundred percent. It understands the the movie understands the book without feeling the need to just recreate everything from it. And I am not familiar with anything else by Patrick McGrath. Let's see, he wrote the short story that became The Lost Explorer in 2010, the novel for Asylum in 2005, um, the novel and screenplay for Gentlemen Don't Eat Poets. He wrote uh, two episodes of The Hidden Room in 19 the 1991 show. And he has an uncredited part in 2005's Asylum. Now, let's see. Right, uh, a critic quote set in London in the late 1980s and explores the effects of an infamous conservative government policy whereby expensive, outdated mental hospitals were streamlined and the inmates were released with limited supervision, a process that was termed care in the community. And, yeah, so this was directed by David Cronenberg, and that is why I'm doing it. You know, love his work. And, you know, basically, you know, currently it's basically one a month. But, yeah, I've been doing basically every, every Cronenberg movie that I have access to. The ones I have on DVD, you know, there's like one that the library allows me to stream... And I and there's one that I that the library has on DVD that I can rent. I've been a fan of Cronenberg since at least the early 2000s. Watched every one of his every movie of his I could get a copy of. So yeah, ranking worst to best, keeping my love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. And the, the yeah, the following ranking will not include this movie. I will update the ranking with this movie at the end of the review itself. So, yeah. The Brood, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, and Videodrome. And like every Cronenberg film I've just mentioned having watched, this doesn't quite take place in the real world. And, you know, Cronenberg doesn't want us to know if the ending is happy or sad, if the characters are good or evil. He wants us to think about these things and make up our own minds on it. And... And in an interview, Cronenberg has said that he thinks there's comedy in all of his movies. And he's happy with how funny they are. And this movie actually started the 20-year period of Cronenberg's career where no feature, as far as I know, haven't watched Chris Malbus or Maps of the Stars yet. He directed had creatures, viruses, bodies changing in ways they can't in real life, etc. Despite him making a career of movies featuring those before that, it ended in 2022 with his release of the new Crimes of the Future. And I know some people were disappointed with this change. I will admit it was very surreal for me almost as surreal as the reality of a Cronenberg film, when I started watching, because, like, some of the first I watched were his, like, 80s stuff. And, yeah, like, it's, there's a, it's incredibly different. Now, yeah, so some critic quotes. All Cronenberg films are about identity. If you're looking for recurring themes that run through Cronenberg's work, there are a few regularly revisited, there are few 
regularly revisited than the more than the idea of body modifications and how modern technology causes people to undergo physical changes that reflect either their true identities or the way they want the world to perceive them and yeah and and that's not there's not a lot of that here this is more psychological than physical uh, trauma <clears throat> and change Many comparisons can be made between this film and Ron Howard film, A Beautiful Mind, in that they both examine the complexities of mental illness. Whereas Howard took the glamorous Hollywood-style approach, Cronenberg continues to prove that less is more when it comes to film. Spider is significantly more effective in that it does not candy-coat its subject, rather approaching the scenario with brute realism. If you have patience and enjoy outstanding and memorable performances, then you will be very much satisfied with this dark and troubling film. Much more disturbing than Videodrome. Okay, I disagree with them on that. But they go on to say, showing almost nothing else than the desperate face of the brilliant finds, this movie is a shocking portrait of mental illness. Let's see. This movie depicts in an extraordinary effective way the paranoid schizophrenia of the main character. One of the best movies I've seen about psychiatric conditions, I must see. My favorite Cronenberg movie came shortly after A History of Violence. And, yeah, so I'm to be trivia. David Cronenberg received the screenplay from Patrick McGrath out of the blue with a note attached saying Rafe Fiennes was interested in playing the part of Spider. After about four pages, Cronenberg had decided that he wanted to do the film. Feeling the movie had very little commercial appeal, the Com Canadian-American distributors only gave it a very limited release, making it a box office bomb. Now, I understand why some people hate the movie. I've already mentioned I loved it. I think important part is that your expectations need to match the final product. Now, that might sound obvious. What I'm saying is the movie's actually well made. I'm not being an apologist for a bad movie. I try to never do that. And uh, let's see. Right, and in an interview... Uh, I forget who, but one of them, one of the people working on this mentioned that it's important to make the audience empathize with this unhoused person seen talking to himself. Which is also something, a beautiful mind, you know, they, they explicitly say that in an interview, that that was part of the goal with the movie. And I do think both of them, you know, i not as big a fan of a beautiful mind as I am of this, but they definitely, that one does definitely achieve that. Now, the. Yeah, so the opening of the movie does a really great job. Like, if you have no idea what you're getting into before watching this, the opening very much, like. Yeah, basically, one of the very first things we see is a train coming into station, and people get off the train and walk towards the camera. And, you know, it's not a big surprise that the protagonist is going to be someone who arrived on that train. You know, that's a fairly straightforward. But the thing that the movie does is, if you don't already know that it's Ray Fiennes, and you're, you know, if you're not sitting there looking, oh, well, that's not Ray Fiennes, that's not Ray Fiennes, you know, if you're just sitting there waiting for the protagonist to, you know, to be, for it to become clear who the protagonist is, you might be surprised that the protagonist is the one who looks the least, like, impressive. You know, you can tell from right away he doesn't have everything, like, he needs help, you know. Let's see. You know, it's, it's very, un, there's a, there's not, enough movies, I think, that focus on trying to get the audience to empathize with someone that we're not used to having as, like, part of our, you know, like, if you know, if, if you personally have, you know, a, a family member or something, you know, some someone in your social circle that is, you know, receiving mental health care treatment, then you'll you'll recognize you you might at least recognize aspects of the Ray Fiennes character Spider, you know. But other than that, like a lot of people, and and you actually see that in some you know 
some of the negative user reviews are just people basically saying I, I resent being asked to empathize with someone who is mentally ill you know that this is not an impressive person this is not you know where where is the the Hollywood lead that I was promised kind of thing now I'm not gonna give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but the ending fits with what came before and yeah I I love the ending of this movie it's it's pitch perfect like that just they they 100% nailed it and yeah so uh, I was not able to get a copy to read or listen through of the original book but I do know that there's you know something major like basically the book is first person perspective adult spider you know sort of explaining very with with a lot of of emotional intelligence a lot of understanding the the his his childhood and the these things you know and you know Cronenberg said you know this is really well written we can't do that for the movie we cannot have voiceover that's this eloquent you know it's gonna stand in stark contrast to Ray Fine's performance we gotta change that you know so so that's a really major difference but the you know I. I've seen a little bit of like interview with Patrick McGrath. He seems happy with how it came out, you know. And and it is also worth noting, like you know, it was like it wasn't Cronenberg who went to the author and said, you know, or or like read the book and it's like, oh, you know, I guess who are we gonna get? I guess we can get the original author. Sure, the original author wanted to make this, and and contacted Cronenberg, which also really shows like he understood he realized that in order to make this work you know it has to be handled what's the word you know it it, it takes a very certain delicate touch it takes someone who really understands and that is something you see from early in his career Cronenberg has a I guess the 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 harsh way to put it would be say a fascination. I'd like to think it's a it's a level of it's a high level of empathy for the the schizophrenic, you know, the 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 brood scanners and this you know are are perhaps the most obvious, you know, but like there's hallucinations and paranoia in a lot of his movies. And I realize paranoia is not exclusive to schizophrenia, but when you look at the way he handles the paranoia, like a lot of the paranoia in his movies, it's like stuff where after you watch the movie, if you if you take a step back, it's like, but that doesn't make logical sense though. That's not, why would anyone think that? And that is, you know, like schizophrenia, as much as some Hollywood screenwriters like to think, is not logical you know it, it is a fundamental way of I, I wanna say I myself also have a lot of empathy for schizophrenia you know I'm not trying to like put them down but it is you know it's it's the the it's a it's the human brain trying to to make sense of, of certain things that like by their nature you can't completely make sense of and that's also something that this movie does a really great job showing and uh, let's see yes so characters um yeah so ray finds as spider or mr clegg this might be my favorite performance of his i th i it's it's like if you've seen him in anything else, like he's he tends to be, I mean, even even when he played a Nazi, there was some measure of like maybe not quite charm, but there was like he could he could say things that would appeal to other people, kind of thing. Where here, 
there's there's no hint of that like there's no like he 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 is aware that other people exist but he doesn't seem to really understand anyone else he's trying to understand himself and some some of the way he maybe thinks he understands other people but he he never you know he's not really going around like you know smiling at people or saying things that put them at ease and these kinds of things you know very early on he arrives at this halfway house and he meets miss wilkinson who who runs the place and like this is the kind of you know you the first time you meet someone and it's this thing like she didn't choose you you know she didn't invite you in she's running a place she's been assigned you you know, like, a, a lot of people are going to try to, like, say something to put her at ease. Try to make a good first impression. Because the first impression is extremely difficult to overcome later on. And he legitimately, like, you get the sense that he didn't really choose to be released from the asylum and into the halfway house. That was just, that was a, you know, some some bureaucrat or something chose that for him. And that's it. Like, he doesn't. He doesn't come across as someone who can completely take care of himself, you know. And just, yeah, uh, uh, Ray Fiennes completely disappears into this character. Like, if you if this was the first thing you saw, you might have a difficult... Like, the next time you see him in something, you might be like, Oh, I didn't know Ray Fiennes had a brother, which he does, but this isn't his... Birth. Anyway, it, like, you know, the the... Just yeah, I've I've never seen him like this, and I I really greatly admire his willingness to to do this. Like honestly, if you if this was the only thing you saw of his, you might actually believe maybe maybe he is like mentally ill. Maybe this is just the way he is. You know, just yeah. And uh, I'm just gonna briefly say, you know, so so I already mentioned that some user reviews are basically, you know, I shouldn't have to empathize with someone who has mental illness, some they used ableist slurs, and one person said Rafe Fine's acting performance is not impressive, which I just that's absurd. That's a ridiculous statement. Considering how different this performance is from how he normally is and how subtle is it subtle it is when compared to like Rain Man and a beautiful mind, you know Hollywood versions of, you know, autism and, and schizophrenia, respectively, like, this is an intensely impressive performance. Like, it, the, the word you're looking for is appealing. It's not appealing. This is not a man that you immediately want to get to know, you know, and that's not really, yeah, you know, it's like, You're you're supposed to want him to be taken care of, you know. That's the that's the response of of someone who has empathy. But it's not like, you know, if I guess if you were related to him, if you if he was already part of your social circle, you try to help take care of him yourself. But otherwise, you probably try to get people who you know are are experts to try to take care of him. Bradley Hall plays the young Spider Clegg. I'll grant that there are a couple of times where his performance feels a tad stiff and, and not completely natural, but a lot of the time, like when he needs to sell something important, he absolutely sells it. Like, I'm. I try not to be hard on child actors because they're children. The, you know, I. I the people we should go hard on are the adults forcing children to act. But with, yeah, Bradley Hall, incredible performance. Miranda Richardson, I suppose I don't want to give away exactly what she plays because that is, I'll just say this is also some of her, her best work and that, yeah high bar, like, unbelievably talented woman, and, yeah, I, you know, it, it's just, the major characters here are cast by unbelievably talented actors, and 
they all deliver such strong performances. Gabriel Byrne plays Bill Clegg, uh, Spider's father. Amazing performance. And, and it's, again, one of those things where, like, I've seen him play really, really charismatic, like, winning personalities. And here, just, yeah, and there's, there's so much to his performance. Like, there's a lot about his character you don't understand while watching. And once you've seen the entire thing, once all the cards have been laid on the table, once you understand everything that happened, which you really only do in retrospect, then you can really appreciate, oh, when he did that, he was actually, oh, wow. Um, John Neville, RIP, plays Terrence. Uh, he is a fellow patient at the half, or former patient now living at the ha halfway house. And Lynn Redgrave, RIP, plays Ms. Wilkinson. And that brings us to... But yeah, um, a lot of the time, like, Fine's character doesn't speak in complete sentences. He'll just, he'll mutter a few words, and that is, like, I do understand being frustrated. This is definitely, if you can watch this with subtitles, if you have a choice, watch it with subtitles, because it's difficult to make out what they're saying. I've never watched it without subtitles. I can imagine it would be extremely frustrating. I, what I will say is, a lot of the time, you can infer it. You don't need to know word for word what was said. You can, you can tell. There are six entries in the IMDb quote section. All of them are good. So this was shot... The, the cinematography was handled by Peter Sushitsky, who has 44 credits. Uh, let's see, the most recent was 2015. And he and... Um, you know, he, yeah, he DP'd a number of Cronenberg films, which, for an auteur like Cronenberg, really means that he delivered exactly what Cronenberg wanted. Auteurs are not known for holding on to people out of, like, oh, you know, I kind of like working with that. No, no. You gave me what I wanted. You get to come back for, for next, you know. Other than this... Maps of the Stars, Cosmopolis, A Dangerous Method, Eastern Promises, A History of Violence, Existence, Crash, yes, the, the not, not the 2004 one, the Cronenberg the Crash, M. Butterfly, Naked Lunch, Dead Ringers, uh, let's see, uh, I guess that's, what, what is that, Fif, fif 15, that can't be right, 10, I, what, whatever, a bunch. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, um, it's, um, yeah, and let's see, right, critic quote for the photography on Spiders, Spider, David Cronenberg enlisted the help of his usual cinematographer, Peter Shishitsky, who shot Cronenberg movies like Crash and Dead Ringers, but is better known for his work on resume builders like the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Spider is a very neutral-looking film shot with plenty of browns, beiges, and grays. So that when something does happen, there's... Uh, let's see... Yeah, when there's strong color, it hits the viewer like a Technicolor hammer. Sushitsky makes up for the absence of fun colors with a penchant... Uh, penchant? Yeah, for cool camera angles. Frequently, they're looking up or down on characters to show the different points of view. The changing trust levels and the shifting... Balances of power. Wait, the crap. I think the mic cut out. Um, okay. 